Welcome to a Millennial's Guide to Real Estate Investing. Here is your host, Antoine Martel. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a Millennial's Guide to Real Estate Investing with Antoine Martel. And today I have a very special guest, um, my father, Eric Martel, who's been with me throughout the whole process of real estate investing um to kind of bring him on here to share a little bit about his story and why he likes real estate investing and kind of he grew up and what mindset he grew up with and then kind of what he's doing today and what his long-term goals are um with real estate investing and passing things down and building a portfolio and all that stuff so welcome well, thank you. I've never been spe- <laughs> I've never been a special guest before. I know. It feels <laughs> That's good. Nice. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we can start off just by um like we were talking on yeah. before. So just I guess tell everybody about your story, where you grew up, I guess how you grew up and mm-hmm. then um play. Sure. Yeah. So I, I grew up, I was born like in the north of Quebec City in, uh, in Canada and uh, literally on the edge of civilization. So, you know, far, far away from the big cities and uh, all of that. And uh, my parents were, you know, hardworking people. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, they were living paycheck to paycheck and, uh, you know, and really didn't put that much money money away aside and stuff like that. I mean, they were really counting on, uh, on the company they worked for to, uh, to pay the pension. Um, so I felt like they, they didn't really have control of their lives. Like even at a young age, I mean, I could see that, you know, they, uh, when I observed my parents, um, you know, they, they were just, they were just working and then they were being, uh, you know, just receiving enough money to survive. And, uh, and not even able to save or anything like well, that. Well, exactly. I mean, it was, uh, it was very hard uh, for them. And then, um, and for me, like, I was really interested uh, about to learn about money. And, uh, I mean, that's kind of like how it, how it started. Uh, really learning about money, learning about uh, investments and all of that. And, um, and I really, so... I really learned in opposition to what they were experiencing. I mean, when I experienced them, I really decided I don't, I don't want to be in that position. So I want to study that and all of that. And um, so even when I went to later on, I went to, uh, to high school and, um, and then I started an investment club in, uh, with one of the teachers <laughs> in high school. I started, I, I love high school. I love the, uh, uh, you know, the teachers there. And, you know, one of the things that I learned when I was in, in high school is really, uh, you just, if you want to do something, just, just make it happen. Say, I, I think we need to do something like that. You gather a couple of people around a teacher and all of that, and you just make it happen. I started like all kinds of clubs. I started, uh, uh, and including the one that I started, uh, was around the, um, stock market investment stock market so really learning yeah. learning about that how to evaluate the stock and all of that and um so i really that was really the the beginning of really familiarizing myself with with the money and then uh you know spending a little bit of money to get a little bit of money in return and um so that's just doing that just playing with money that money is a tool that you can um that you know you make you make it work for you kind of thing uh, but yeah. how did you what made you be so interested in money because a lot of kids today or millennials today you know grow up and they read rich, they grow up in the same situation but then they read rich dad poor dad or they watch a rich dad poor dad video but being where you were without you know youtube or all those kinds of things was it just like a book you found at the library or what the hell made you even think that of that way yeah i think there was a couple of components i think one of them is that i where i grew up was like very far away so uh so i knew that i I didn't want to (laughs) be i didn't want to live there and i always saw myself i said you know one day i'm going to be uh like a citizen of uh, an international citizen that's what's kind of my 
uh, my idea to, to be an international citizen, not really be, uh, you know, being Canadian was good, American is good and stuff like that. But to me, even those two, that was too, uh, too narrow. I wanted to belong to uh, and be able to travel everywhere and be, be comfortable anywhere in the world. Yeah. Um, so I like that. So that was one component of it. The other component of it was, um, so kind of how, how do you get there? And, uh, so that's so you have to figure figure out how how do I get there? How do I achieve my my dream? And a lot of that kind of came by by luck a little bit. Uh, when I went to high school, one of the things that I did, of course, I didn't have much money. I think I was making like ten dollars a, a week in uh, allowance. Uh, but when I went to high school, uh, I spent that. I I started also a um, a stamp and coin collecting club. Oh, yeah. And um, so this is uh, where this was really a market because I would go and buy uh, stamps from somebody uh, at a cheaper price and I would bring it uh, to uh, to school at the club and then we would sell it and then I'd make money. It's just like, wow, this is like, this is great and make like a big return. And then I had uh, a certain amount of money and I said, and then we kind of like go to the next level. And um, so that's kind of how I, I got started. And um, sure. kind of think that, okay, well, you know, that with money, you make money with, you know, with money, with some knowledge, and then really uh, like doing something, like leaving it in the bank, you know, that didn't, that didn't give me anything. Even in those days, uh, they didn't pay much interest uh, in the bank either. But really, I, I got the sense that in order to make money, you had to, you had to do something with, uh, with your assets and with your money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then so so you kind of started off like that, learned about money, interested in it, and then you went to university and then you studied actuary, yep. right? That's right. Yeah. So again, the math, the finance, uh, the blend of the two, I think that was something that was very interesting to me. Um, like really learning about the, the in, there was some in as, investment aspect to that. Uh, but it was really the the math and the finance and the um, so that really uh, got me going. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so that was interesting in some way. But the really really interesting part is that after the during the first year of uh, university, I I had a girlfriend and then you know and uh, we, her mother's boyfriend was really into real estate. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and it was he, the things that he did were pretty amazing because he was a teacher uh, at the college over there, uh, making some, you know, some reasonable living, but nothing extravagant and stuff like that. And he managed on the, to build a 36-unit apartment building uh, on his own. Build it. Build it. Yeah. And then uh, it's amazing. And he had, you know, he really had no no money. He didn't inherit anything. He didn't. Yeah. He didn't have huge saving, and he had a very ordinary salary. And um, so he managed to to do that. And he was uh, so he became basically my mentor at that point. I had seen like uh, things on TV about you know buy real estate, no money down, and all that kind of stuff. And but uh, like he did it like from scratch. And um, wow. he basic, yeah, and he basically, uh, that was the thing, like, he just made things happen. Like, he would, he would sit down, uh, uh, like, wake up early in the morning before going to, to uh, teach his, uh, his class, and he would sit down, and he would just think, and he would just plan, and would say, okay, well, this is what I'm going to, I need to do. I need to do this, and this, and this, and he would plan, yeah. and contact people, and, and kind of every day that's he had a goal and he would just went towards his goal uh, yeah i mean so even the playing the cash flow board game so that's a mm -hmm. rich dad poor dad game mm -hmm. and you know it shows you choose a card and there's anything from a lawyer to a truck driver to a professor yeah. but some of the easiest cards in that game are the people who just have the lowest amount of expenses yeah sometimes yeah <laughs> So, you know, a teacher who's living a minimalistic lifestyle, it doesn't matter if he's making 30, 40 grand, mm -hmm. if he's, he could still be saving more than the lawyer is sometimes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and then they use that cash to, you know, they save 15 grand in the, in the board game and in real life. 
and then they can buy a house and yep. then they're making 200 bucks a month, you know, and their expenses might only be a thousand bucks. They only need, <laughs> yeah. they only need four houses to, you know, to be done with. Um, so yeah, that's, but that's interesting you say that because when I play the board game, I would rather be the janitor than the lawyer with college debt and all that kind of crap. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's is. Uh, I mean, the game is great. I mean, we, you know, you play it and you get the doctor and say, "All right, I'm a doctor." And like <laughs> you, you look at, you look at how much debt you have, and it's just like, "Oh my god." Yeah. And this is. I mean, we've talked about about it before too. Like in the Bay Area, I mean, there was a, an article that was published, and it was people that were, you know, making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, but they're living paycheck to paycheck. You know, yeah. uh, I'm one of those people, and uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> but um, or I was, and um, so anyway, so this is uh, this is kind of uh, it's yeah, it's kind of you think about it and you say, well, it's not where you start that matters, is where you're going, and then you know, coming up with a plan. Uh, yeah, you may yeah. if you make uh, less money, it, it's going to take a little bit longer, maybe. But once you get going, yeah, it's going to snowball and then you, you're yeah. going to get there. Exactly. And, and yeah, or I was talking to somebody yeah, and I was talking to somebody on bigger pockets and they're like, I can only save 15 grand a year, you know, yeah. from their from their job or whatever. And I was like, and they're like, I want to get to 10 grand a month in cash flow. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, it only, you know, it starts with the first property, you know, mm -hmm. with 15 grand, you can either save for five years and put a down payment for an apartment building and, you know, put yeah. all your eggs in one basket or you can save 15 grand in one year, yeah. use mm -hmm. that to buy a property. Then the whole next year, you're going to be making an extra 250 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all going to add up by the end of the year. And then, you know, you save, save that money for, for another year. And then you buy another property. Yeah. Now that year you're making 500 bucks a month and it just, you know, snowballs from there. That's right. And yeah, it's going to take you more time because you're saving less, but um, you know, that's why it's important to get started early and to spend less time pondering too, and more time just, putting your money, you know, investing your money instead of leaving it in the stock market or mutual fund or wherever it is. Yep. That's right. Yeah. I mean, you look at some of the houses that, uh, that we're selling, you know, you had $70,000, you put $17,000 down and you get $250 a month. Yeah. And then you, people look at that and say, well, and my net cash flow is only $250 a month. Yeah. And so the, and then they say, oh, well, that's, that's not worth it. It's, yeah, but people need to bring that into perspective. So you invested seventeen thousand dollars, and then you know you're making two hundred and fifty dollars uh, return. So what is your return on that money? You yeah. know, and calculate that because yeah. that seventeen thousand dollars that's in the bank, uh, you're not getting two hundred and fifty dollars a month from the bank yeah. uh, in interest. Yeah. And so yeah, yeah or kind of sometimes to... how I yeah or how I like to think about it is. You spend, you spend 20 grand or whatever it may be. And then for the next 30 years, you know, your, your cable and your phone bill is, is covered for the rest of your life kind of thing mm -hmm. from just a one investment kind of thing too. So I like to think about it too, sometimes as taking off expenses as well, or, you know, you make one investment and now you can lease a car for the rest of your life or, you know, all your car, your car note payment is, is pretty much paid off for mm -hmm. the rest of your life or whatever, just for yeah. that one investment. And then yeah. on top of that, the tax benefits and all that other stuff that comes That's right, building yeah. equity that comes along with it, which you don't get in the, you know, even if you were in a, a stock that provided some sort of cash flow. Yeah, out. that's right. Yeah. 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 That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, then I guess, well, then talk about your first real estate investment ever, because I know it's shortly yeah. after you went to college. Yeah, that's right. So in, in, during my first year, so I was talking to uh, this guy. So he became my mentor and then he taught me some concepts and, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, kind of how to evaluate the company and kind of like, okay, well, there's a, there's a lot of information in the, and there's a lot of data and all of that. And then, but, you know, focus on what's important and all of that and so the, the the idea of the mentorship too or the coaching is kind of gives you a, like a safe environment uh to kind of go and explore and stuff like that and um because otherwise if you if you're doing something and you say oh my god you know what happens if and what happens that and then you kind of it's out, you're doing something that's out of your comfort zone 
Oh yeah. And then right, remember the first time we put the, we put an offer out there. It was <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we were like uh, not freaking out, but we were a little bit nervous and uh, say, oh my god, I can put Accept an it. offer. <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> Exactly. But uh, yeah, so that's nice uh, to do the uh, you know the mentorship, and and I know at one that you're doing you're doing mentorship also for uh, for some uh, people, um, yeah. And this is important because as you're experimenting and starting to play with your your assets or your cash or your money in the bank, you want to know you want to have somebody beside you and say I, you know this is okay you're gonna be okay like and then somebody that can answer your question and. You know, you're going to get there. So that's what this guy gave me, like he, the mentorship and the support saying that, okay, well, no, that's fine. Don't worry about that. But don't worry about that for now. Right now, just find this, do this and do that. And you're going yeah. to be fine. And um, so there we go. So that's uh, that's what I did. And then I went to, uh, to a realtor uh, to a, a small town outside of a uh, small city outside of Montreal. <clears throat> and then I, I went to uh, to a realtor and I said, well, you know, this, I had set up all my criteria, what I was looking for. I was, I was looking for cash flow positive property, and I was looking for no money down cash flow properties. So, because were you in college at this time? or I was in college. Graduate? Yeah, I had no money. My oh, parents wow. were giving me $500 a month to pay for the, my, my rent, which was like $285 or $250. And yeah. then uh, the rest was food and stuff like that. And, you know, so and that was it. So, yeah. Okay. And entertainment and all of that. So there was not much left. Basically, so at, the, no at, money. at the end of the month, yeah, there was not nothing left. I couldn't really save unless I really yeah. cut down. Um, <laughs> and no more the, eating. In those days, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, so I spent a lot of, so contacted the realtor, um, you know, and said, this is what I'm looking for. And this is the kind of property, the price and all of that and kind of my criteria. And then, um, so, okay, so we sat down with me and he opened this, a binder full of MLS listing. In those days, there were no computers uh, mm-hmm. well, available to everybody. There was no PCs. So, um, yeah, so we'd look at that and then we'd say, okay, well, okay, let's look at this one. And so does that work? And then I would do the f- calculations, stuff like that, no. And then go, no. And then we look probably at 10 or 20 and stuff like that. And... And I realized it was kind of like just, uh, you know, he was trying to prove that it, it was, to me that it didn't exist. Like you can find a property that was, uh, that met my criteria and he was, you know, so, you know, Perfect. so then I asked him, I said, well, can I just borrow, it was like a couple of binders full of MLS this thing and say, can I just borrow these two binders for the, for a couple of days and I'll just, uh, I'll see if I can find something. So um, I convinced, my, convinced myself that if there is something or not. And uh, so I had carried a, a shortcut, you know, kind of like a little ratio that was based on, on the rent, the total rent and the revenue. And I said, well, if it meets this ratio, then I'll go, I'll go a little deeper. So I basically analyzed that, that way, like uh, hundreds of properties. And then I just quickly say, okay, you know, no, no. No. Was it a rent to value ratio? Yes. Yeah. And then just do you remember what do you remember what you were looking for? No, I don't remember what I was looking for. Okay. But I had come up with I I basically put up the the whole uh, uh, profit and loss statement, uh, and then kind of you know and kind of worked it backwards. Um, That's how I had done it, and I had come up with a ratio. And then I would look at that ratio and say, okay, well, this one is good. I can, I can go a little deeper. Yeah. So that was a quick, uh, quick way to uh, kind of focus on some, some properties. And at the end, I probably had like 10 properties that, uh, that were interesting. And of course I had no money. So the next criteria after that was, and and my mentor kept telling me (laughs) that kept telling me, don't worry about the money. So I said, okay. (laughs) And then, uh, yeah, but he, he didn't lend me money. I thought he would maybe he meant that he's going to lend me some money, but he never did. So, um, so I said, okay, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so don't worry about that. Just find the right thing. I said, okay. I said, okay, there. I found ten. 
and said, okay, well, what you are gonna do, this is how we're gonna, so you need to find like the 25% down and all of that. So you're gonna try to look for seller financing, right? So call them up and see if they are interested in doing seller financing. And uh, out of those, there was one of them that was interested uh, in doing that. And it was for an eight units uh, apartment building in, uh, in the town. So, and I put my offer up and uh, contingent on uh, having the, the seller financing and the, and the primary financing as well. And um, yeah, so I got, I got the, uh, the offer signed back and then, uh, then I started looking for financing. Yeah, because uh, yeah, so how the hell are you going to get financing? Exactly. <laughs> so I thought, so because it was, it was kind of a commercial property, they were focused a lot more on the, um, oh. on the cash flow. Right. So, okay. and then, um, but you know, I went to the regular banks and they didn't, you know, they didn't want anything to do. They didn't want to lend me money, but I went to a credit union and then they were more open to that. And then they looked at the cash flow and I, I explained to the lady, I said, you know, this, I don't understand. I said, I'm making money. I, I, after I've paid all my expenses, I had a contingency fund. I had, uh, and I paid the mortgage and stuff. I, I was left with like $300 a month, uh, you know, net cash flow. I said, I don't understand yeah. why they don't want to lend me the money. I mean, this is a no brainer. So anyway, she liked the deal and she said, yeah, we, we like the deal. I'm going to present it to the, the board and all of that. And said, so all I need is a check for 75 bucks. She said, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I had like, a, I think I had like $100 in the bank at the time. Oh, shit. So I wrote, I wrote the check for $75, but she, she, uh, she didn't give me a hundred percent that it would go through, but she said, uh, yeah, it's pretty positive. I think you have a pretty good chance of, um, of getting the loan. So I got the loan and, uh, yeah, so I took possession of, uh, of the property at that point. And, um, yeah, and I was meeting my, my net cash flow. Do you remember what the interest rate was or the terms for that? No, I don't remember, but I, yeah, I don't remember. It would have been interesting to see what yeah. the hell they would have been giving back then, especially for commercial properties. I don't yeah. know what it, what it would have been. But in Canada, at the time in Canada, like I didn't feel there was a big difference. Uh, like here in the U.S., like four, if it's four units, it's uh, residential and five units it's and more, it's commercial. And they, yeah. have, they, they have different rules. At the time in Canada, I don't remember if there was any, I didn't notice any difference. Like oh, I didn't, really? but I had never done any other kind of mortgage before. So, yeah. so I don't, I don't really know, but so I didn't feel like, oh, this is like commercial. Then we have to go to commercial lending or anything. Yeah. Like it was all under yeah. the same kind of thing. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Your first ever mortgage was on an eight unit apartment building. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And then, so what happened with that? How long did you have it? So I had it probably for, uh, up until I moved to Toronto, probably like, uh, I'd say like three or four years, something like that. Yeah. But one of the things that I did, uh, that I was kind of a little bit of a mistake, uh, is to not get the property management. Um, you know, so that I should have really paid for the property management for it. <clears throat> And then that would have helped me because I had to I had to go there and then collect some money and then and then figure and do some repairs and stuff like that and you know how good I am at doing repairs. Um, so I don't want to touch me. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine with even less experience. <laughs> God. But uh, yeah, so that was a little bit of a mistake. It would have really. But did it me. also did it also just make you not enjoy it? Too, and then is that why yeah. there was a lull in investing after that, right? Because you kind of did right. this, and then you didn't invest for time. That's true. And it's because yeah. you had a because you had you, know, you had a bad experience because you because you had to deal with all the tenants and take the headache on. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. Um, it was really even though I was making the the cash, like I really felt like I was, John. I was really paying it for, I was paying for it because I had to go and fix some guys plumbing and I had to go 
you know, fix the heater and then fix a window and all of that. It's like, oh my God. Wasn't there, doesn't you tell me a story of there was a, in the winter, one yeah. of the windows blew out? What, yeah. say that one? Well, that one is the windows blew, uh, was broken and stuff like that, but they owed me money <laughs> for the rent. So I said, well, you pay me the rent off <laughs> the window. So. <laughs> But didn't so, you go into their apartment and there was snow all over their house? There was, yeah, there was a little bit of <laughs> snow in the living room. <laughs> oh my but, god! But um, yeah, I mean, it's like I had no, I had no money. Like I had, uh, I was living on that cash flow, right? So because yeah. after I, so the thing, after I bought that apartment building, I my parents, uh, I told my parents, I was all excited. Uh -oh. I. I was all excited, but as you can imagine, they were <laughs> they went totally ballistic, and then um, and then they cut off my allowance. Oh my god! So yeah, so I had to move in with my girlfriend and all that. And um, but anyway, yeah. So they were pretty pretty ticked off. Wow. Okay. Yep. So that's and why there, when yeah, that window there. broke, there was no money to fix it. Oh, and so they paid for rent. Okay. And then, so then from there, um, so then you graduate college and then you start working in Toronto, right? That's right, yeah. And then, you know, consulting actuary, big... yeah. And then some, the guy finally called me to sell the prop. Uh, somebody was interested in buying the property, so yeah. I sold the property when I was in Toronto. So that was all, um, all done there. Uh, and then the second experience that we had in Toronto, so I, you know, I married you, your mother. Yeah. And then, um, then we bought our first uh, house. Uh, we actually moved in an apartment. And then after that, we bought our first house at, I think like 17, the mortgage was like 17% interest. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. So payments were high and all of that. And then our plan was really to, uh, rent the basement. Okay. So, um, so that was good. So we rented the basement to do some you know, couple, a young couple and all of that. And it seemed good. They had like an independent entrance. <clears throat> so no problem there. Yeah. For the first year it was fine. Then the second year, like the guy lost a job and then they didn't pay rent and all of that and all kinds of problems like that. A mother moved in and, you know, oh my God. so we had to evict them and all of that. And then, and then you're again, you know, so I was the property manager, uh, yeah. and the, the tenants were right in with, uh, in our house. So it was really painful. Yeah. And, um, so your mother was like, was not pleased. <laughs> yeah. Not pleased with that. So then we, then, then we kind of like, when these guys moved out after evicting them, we didn't rent the basement anymore. And that was, that really put a damper on that because I, after that, uh, you were born, yeah. you were born in that house. And then, uh, then after that, we said, okay, uh, let's just change everything yeah. and all of that. And then we wanted to move to California yeah, and all of that. So that's when we ended up here. Um, Got yeah. And so we, so we actually sold the house. We moved into, we rented a, another house. Uh, and then we, we eventually moved to, uh, to California. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, yeah. So it's kind of those two experiences that you had in Toronto or Canada, yeah. which were both not good just because of the property management aspect then. That's right. Yeah. It would have been a lot pleasant. I mean, you're looking at some of the properties we have now, you know, and then, you know, I, I know we had, we had some issues with, uh, but it was handled by the property management, all the problems and all of that. And exactly. So, you know, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. It costs, I had to write a little check, you know, to fix it, but yeah. 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 Well, better. you hear that a lot too. Like I, there's a lot of friends that I have who, you know, I tell them about what I'm doing and they want to invest in real estate or whatever it may mm -hmm. be or, or clients or whatever. And then they say, they talk about their parents and their story and, um, you know, many of them have a very similar thing where they just don't even know that property management companies exist except yeah. for huge buildings. Right. Yeah. So then they have these experiences that just shuts them off. Yeah. 
Um, so I've had people invest with me or buy houses from Martel Turnkey, and they just say, um, yeah, my parents are don't know what the hell I'm doing, so i got to come up with this. Help me convince them to buy this, do this investment kind of thing. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, why are they like that? And then they say a super, super similar story to you. Well, they had some rental properties, and they were in, they were out of state and wherever, Arizona and or Las Vegas, and they were trying to manage them from afar. And the tenants did this, this, and this to the house. Yeah. And, yeah. and then they, you know, then they just get sick of it and they just sell the property at a loss and just take their money out and put it in the stock market where somebody else can lose it instead of themselves. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but yeah, that turns off a lot of people for sure. But then mm-hmm. also for mom too, then if you went and wanted to pitch her another real estate investing opportunity, she's not going to, she's not going to want to bite on it either. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. That makes it a pain too. Well, especially if I'm going to talk to her and say, we're going to manage, we're going to be the property manager. I mean, this, she's not going to be, yeah, she's never going to do that again. She's not going to do that. (laughs) Yeah. From that experience. Yeah. Yeah. So then, okay. So then, um, moved to California, Mm-hmm. in 2000 then you were working traveling a lot and then saving up money yeah and then you know went from 2000 to 2006 and was working a lot mm-hmm. i remember because i didn't yeah. see you <laughs> and then oh. and then um well no you were literally traveling every week i would only yeah. see you on the weekends yeah um you lived in Seattle or some some yeah, that's right and Boeing Boeing and yeah. then so that you were doing that for like literally 6 years and then but you were making good money well everybody was making good money then yeah so then what were you were you just save like stock buying cash well, it was stock option money? right so yeah. i was ex- accidentally saving yeah. uh with the stock option so the company i was working for i was working with them in Toronto and I yeah. transferred with them. That's right. So I had a guaranteed job here. And then, yeah, so with the stock options, so that was a pretty good windfall. But as soon as I arrived, we arrived here in 2000 yeah. and then the market crashed at the end of 2000. So, so I sold some of my stock options. I didn't sell everything because, oh, I didn't know what was going on. And yeah. uh, with the taxes and stuff like that, I heard about the AMT and I heard about, uh, the alternative minimum tax and all of that. So I kind of like, I didn't want to sell everything. I said, oh, I'm just going to wait. Uh, I'm just going to sell like a, I sold a quarter of them or something like that. And then we'll see what it is and stuff. Yeah. Like that. Uh, and I would have reinvested it in the stock market anyway. I would have just diversified. Yeah. Uh, but the whole market uh, crashed at that point. And then, um, but I still had, you know, some money. So I was kind of like disaffected by the, the stock market. And uh, so I was, we were looking to kind of like other investments. Uh, we, we thought of uh, investing in, um, in rental properties again. And then we lived in the Bay area and uh, we talked to realtors and all of that. And said, well, you know, there's nothing here. I said, if you want to buy something that's cash flow positive, you're going to have to go to Fresno or Bakersfield. Yeah. And I did look uh, there. I didn't drive there. Which, by the way, for everybody not from California, Fresno and Bakersfield is in Central Valley of California. It's very, it's a couple hour drive from any major city. Um, Kind of far, like a lot of farming is in the Central Valley. So it's like little small Mm -hmm farming town i guess you can say they do have a college there but um yeah yeah. okay keep going yeah so and it was you know so we looked at buying there and there was some cash flow properties there and uh but then we looked at okay well well, how we i'm not gonna go and i don't want to have to drive down there uh and then do anything you know like if there's some big things that need to be done yes i can get a property manager to do it but I felt that I had to be close because of some of the, you know, negative experience that I had in the past. Yeah. And I felt like I, I needed to be close. Yes, get a property manager, but still being able to keep an eye have on, a it. Touch yeah. on it. Yeah. That's right. And then, um, so that's, you know, that's why we decided not to go there. And instead we, we bought a house. Uh, we bought a house instead. So. Hmm. so turned out it was a, 
in the in the end it was a good uh, good return I was when we sell it we'll know what a good return it is but uh, <laughs> but yeah so uh, so that's what we did and then I invested the uh, money in the stock the rest of the money in the stock market yeah and, you know I was doing pretty good but stock market is pretty good but you are not in control of of what's happening, right? There's all the news. There's always the surprises. You don't know what the government is going to do. You don't know what the economy is going to do. You don't know what China is going to do. This company, yeah. all of that. So, you have no idea. Uh, yeah. Control, and I wanted to be in control. So I wanted to somewhat in control, or at least know what's going on. Uh, have you know, being able to know what the business, how the business is doing, and then be able to react. Yeah. Um, so I didn't like uh, didn't like that. And um, <clears throat> and I've always wanted. I was always looking for passive income, right? So that that was the key, uh, you know, to uh, to have that, you know, having uh, because I was doing consulting. So to me, you know, th- there's no worse active <laughs> income than consulting. I was independent consultant. So I had my own company, and then when I go on vacation, the money st- stops coming in. If yeah. I'm sick one day, there's no money coming in. So, yeah. and so I was really like, we need to find a way to have the money coming in, you know, uh, passively, so that I I can go on vacation and the money still comes in. Blah blah. blah. Yeah. So that's why we did some uh, some things like uh, you know the, our culinary twist uh, company with the sauce and all of that. And the goal was to basically, okay, well, it's sold at the store, and then you know we don't have to do much work. Uh, you know, and then it's passive income, basically. We just have to deal with the orders and then, you know, the distributors yeah. and the thing sells for itself. Well, it didn't work out this way. But, uh, but yeah, so that was the plan there. Yeah, so this, so for everybody else, this is a company that my dad and my mom started called Culinary Twist. It was a gourmet line of sauces that was in Whole Foods. Um, what's that other store called? Whole Foods, it was also in... Uh, cost Plus World Market, yeah, cost, yeah. nationally. So yeah. it was selling well, but they had been doing it for 10 years. And still at the end of 10 years, it was... I mean, the food business is already is hard to get into, yeah. especially retail. Yeah. So um, after 10 years, they realized that they had spent enough time and had not mm-hmm. made enough money to shut it down. But that was kind of the goal with creating that was the passive income to have another income stream rather than just working, you know, spending your time for money. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so, so again, so then I was looking for more passive income and also as you're getting older, you're kind of thinking, okay, well, I'd like to be able to have some flexibility. Yeah. Like I, I enjoy doing consulting and all of that, but I'd like to take six months off. Uh, so, but I can't afford to take six months off and that's not sure. get money in. Right. So, so that's why I just wanted to have some flexibility, uh, in my life. And then, so that's, and then you guys were like, uh, you and your brother were getting old and you were, and you, well, older. (laughs) Wow. And you had one at, uh, at, uh, what, 17, you already had started like three or four companies and you had like Uh things being manufactured in China and. Uh-huh. <laughs> all of that the websites that's right and uh you know what you know all kinds of things i mean so that was uh very interesting so i i knew i had a feeling you were ready <laughs> i yeah. was ready i was ready to lean on you and uh you and your brother to uh you know to uh start something like i wanted to start something that was for, for the family and that uh that leaves a legacy yeah. Um, and by legacy, I don't mean just the pile of money at the end, and then you give it to the kids, and then they they spend it all in a work in a couple of years. So leaving a legacy is really having the uh, your you know your successor understand the business and being able to be interested and being able to pick it up. And yeah. um, but so now, obviously, it's now <laughs> you're leading it. <laughs> So I'm the one who's going to have to follow in, in your trails, but um, so I so I think yeah that's exactly um, 
you know that was that was the goal there is to leave again legacy and uh yeah and um, and having the passive income to really have the flexibility and flexibility for for me and and the family and uh, also for future generation i'm also thinking for your kids you know so that they they can really do what they want uh, and i'm yeah. thinking also about uh, education too like the cost of education going up and all of that and yeah and and i think my I'm thinking that if the, the cost of education continues to grow the way that it is, then you're going to be the last generation that's going to be able to afford uh, to go to college, to go to university. Yeah. So that's why I'm thinking kind of like. So then uh, so the uh, answer for all that was, was real estate and real estate investing. So that, so then yeah. it came back in your life many years later, but in a different fashion. So that's right. What had changed or what made you uh, interested in, into real estate what was that trigger then so that's a good question but i always liked real estate i mean you know when whenever we go on vacation we always yeah, yeah, true. we always go and uh, look at open houses. i know isn't that crazy uh, yeah so no matter where so i was always interested that you know and then there was the um and I know that I and I know that uh, real estate is very solid. So I always knew that. I mean, if you rent uh, the property, I mean, it, your rent uh, gets indexed automatically. I mean, you have all kinds of tax benefits and you have all kinds of uh, uh, advantages that you don't have in, with other investments. You can leverage your asset and really multiply your investment, uh, which allows you to get a big, better return. Yeah, all that. So. To me, that was kind of a, a kind of not a no-brainer, but it was kind of uh, an, an easy decision. The question was, where are we going to do that? And um, so we we had tried to do like also like uh, flips here in the Bay Area, and that, you know the market is crazy here. So we knew the real the the rental market was not good here, so we needed to find out you know, kind of where, where to go yeah. for that. And uh, so I think that's, this is where, you know, you did a lot of the digging uh, for that and uh, for the data and, uh, and figure out the different markets. And, you know, we had come up with uh, some different metrics, like what market to go to and what, what's the, uh, the GDP for that city and, yeah. and all of that. And then that's when we started looking. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, and you really, uh, you know, built a lot of that, the strategy and, uh, you know, associated with that. I mean, how do, how do we, how do we do that? What is the, the, the methodology or the process of really investing, investing out, of out of state? Yeah. And then yeah. still have control and then enjoy, uh, enjoy the benefit of owning yeah. that property. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, because we had, because we were more interested in the cash flow thing, but you know, flipping houses locally, kind of, we thought, okay, we can do that to flip some houses in the Bay Area and then use that cash to invest it wherever. We thought locally too, like properties made, you know, you buy an apartment building and it's gonna make, it's gonna make money, right? Yeah. Well, actually, no, they don't. Yeah. Um, you know, properties in in the Bay area, even in the East Bay duplexes, quads, you know, many of them just don't cash flow or they cash flow not enough to take the risk and take a million, $2 million loan on your name, mm -hmm. putting all your personal assets at risk. Yeah. So, but I remember you telling me the story too, of you, you know, how you buy your eight unit apartment building and the, mm -hmm. the numbers and metrics you used. And this is way before bigger pockets or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and then I was, I was like, okay, well, what numbers were you using? I use your metrics kind of thing. And I, yeah. did, I literally did the same thing as you. I remember I had a notebook yeah, that was like 250 pages or whatever. And each page was the certain numbers. So the rent minus la, 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 la. And then mm -hmm. I was looking for a certain number. And I remember just doing that 250 times, literally. Mm -hmm. And then I went to, I said, no, no, dad, nothing works here mm -hmm. and then you're like okay we'll go further and then i remembered like doing sacramento or fresno so that's like a couple hour drive away from us yeah and then still i was like okay the numbers work but now we have to go to fresno yeah and then we were like okay well this doesn't make sense anymore blah blah yeah. blah and then i think we started to network too because yeah. i was really i was super interested in it mm -hmm. and i know we can make it work 
Um, and then I think I started just networking more. And then you and Aiton went to a networking event as well. And yep. then at that event, you met some guys who were actually investing out of state. And then yep. that's where it kind of all made sense to us. And then I was like, oh, yeah, well, I can do these. I can take another binder and do these properties out of state. Mm -hmm. And then the numbers really start to make sense. We just have to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And then we had met this guy who had was flipping houses out of state who we invested with and stuff like that. And kind of learned how we built this process for flipping houses mm -hmm. and then kind of took that and changed it, you know, for the cash flow game instead of the, instead of flipping houses. Yeah. Well, also we were looking at other turnkey buyers, right? We were looking at providers, at providers. That's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at turnkey providers and say, okay, well, where are they selling and all of that? Yeah. And we start looking at these numbers. And, you know, for us, like it looked, because we had looked at flipping houses before, we knew how to, how to analyze that. Then we kind of look and say, well, you know, this, the ARV or the after repair value seems a little bit high. And then we would look online and say, this is how much they paid for it. This is uh, how much they're trying to sell and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And then we said, we said, okay, well, maybe we just, uh, we want to cut the middle, man. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And go ahead do it. Well, we had the time. Well, we had the time and the assets, too, because I was in mm -hmm. school still, and I think I had an internship and was probably had three businesses or something. But I mm -hmm. also wanted to, uh, you know, this was something, too, that I wanted to spend time on. And yeah, it is yeah, a yeah. business as well, because yeah. many people say that, too, not only about, but those, the turkey providers we were looking at, too, were just way over selling their properties Absolutely. as well yeah. so we would we would see we would run comps on their their properties and they, they were selling it for 90 grand and we would run comps and it would be like at seventy thousand dollars and we're mm -hmm. like this i'd rather just buy something at retail then and find my own call a property management company there's no point in me paying mm -hmm. an extra 20 grand you know for your support for your yeah. phone call to your property management company yeah. i can do that i could fly to memphis and have a stay there for three months and find somebody and still save mm -hmm. less than $20,000. Yeah. Um, but that's, yeah, you're right. That's really where, what did trigger us too, because we had learned about turnkeys and then we were, um, you know, researching online about them mm -hmm. and how they were, how they ran their business, all this kind of stuff. But they were just gouging yeah. every time they heard out of state investor, they were just gouging the hell out of them. And yeah. um, we had the time and energy to kind of go in and find our own deals instead. And, <laughs> We ended up not, you know, staying away from the stuff at retail and just mm -hmm. buying stuff that needed a lot of work. And it was more work for us because now we had to find way more team members, the realtor, the the contractor, inspector, all that kind of stuff. But yeah. Um, and then that's when we started to to add value to these properties and then kind of grow our own portfolio in that sense. And yeah. Just started in one market and then took that model and expanded to to the other markets after that yeah yeah i tried to look at the metrics of uh, of memphis and say hey you know this is working in memphis what other cities have the same metrics yeah, yeah. We, you oh, know, yeah that's we, right we compile a whole list of uh you know and that's why we ended up in you know in st louis and cleveland and, and yeah and all of that well, i think we were even in a hotel room or something like that and mm -hmm. we had we had like we were close to buying a our third property in memphis or something and we were yeah like, what if we found some other places where this is happening like we can, yeah. we could just expand the, the diversify it to a couple different cities is what we were thinking. And then and I remember yeah. being in a hotel room with the Excel, the Google sheet or whatever. And we were um, like, okay, what's the GDP of this city <laughs> or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was me, you and Aiton were in a hotel. Yeah. 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 That's what I like about this business. And this is what, you know, I think everybody, and this is, you know, you have to think of it as a business. Yeah. Uh, and then you have to think of yourself, like if you're the only person there, I mean, you have to think of yourself as the CEO of that business. Of course, for our family, we have a board of director. So it's a little bit uh, different because we have uh, multiple people involved. But <clears throat> the, uh, but yeah, I mean, and this is kind of like when I start, when I build my eight unit apartment building, you know, I was not thinking as a businessman. Like I was thinking as this uh, building is paying me for my food uh that i'm living on and so it was not it was not a pleasant experience and because i didn't have the property management i was not really thinking of hey this is my business and uh this is uh i'm gonna 
this is what I'm going to work on and I'm going to find another deal that similar to that yeah. and I'm going to build my business. But of course, you know, I wanted to make uh, money and I was looking for a job and all of that. So it was a little bit of the, the, the wrong timing maybe, but yeah. But, but I think if somebody that's as young as you that just uh, graduated, uh, like a millennial that just graduated, has a job, uh, this is the perfect time to to invest because I, I remember when I started working, I was making more money now than I could uh, that I could save and uh, that I could uh, spend. So I was just like, okay, well, you know, I was just buy stuff. Yeah. Uh, so that was and this. So that's why this is the perfect time. If if I had started to uh, <laughs> to invest at that time but yeah. of course toronto was a horrible place to invest as well for cash flow positive property but uh and if i had invested that in uh, in another state or another province you know i would i wouldn't be worried about working right now that's for yeah. sure yeah you know so this is the perfect time because you have all that extra disposable income yeah i mean you live you you, you no make kids, uh, right no you wife. Make, yeah. that's right so that's the perfect time to save a little bit of money. And then you can easily, I mean, you talk about the cash flow game. Uh, your expenses are very low right now. Yeah. Uh, so it's very easy to come up with positive cash flow that's going to, you know, cover your uh, your monthly expenses. Yeah. Right. Yep. So exactly. it's going to make some, I shouldn't say it's very easy, but it takes some effort, but it's very achievable. Yeah. to do it in the next couple of years, in the next well, few years. Yeah, and also when, when you first graduate, you have your first job, hopefully you're still living, you know, mm-hmm. at, at or below your means. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, you don't get your first job and you just start spending every dollar you get in. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it also helps too because now it makes your goals way more achievable. Yeah. If you're 20, 30, 35 years old and you have, you know, you're working or whatever it may be and you're still living below below your means or at your means and not spending all your income and you're keeping Mm -hmm. your expenses down, then, you know, you look at these properties that make 250 bucks a month and, you know, your monthly expenses may be Mm $2,000, $1,000. It makes your goals way more achievable. Whereas, you know, if people are in your situation where, you know, you're 50, 60, 70 years old or whatever, been working your whole life and now you want to start, well, Mm -hmm. now you're, you know, now you have two kids, they're both in college you have to pay for those expenses, which there is going to be even five thousand dollars, you know, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand dollars a month just to mm-hmm. pay for your kids to go to school. Yeah. And now yeah. investing in rental properties for two hundred fifty bucks a month it doesn't make sense because you're going to need four thousand of them instead mm-hmm. of instead of four, five, six of them. Um, yeah. And yeah, so starting early is is definitely key, but also. Yeah. Right now is a great time to buy too, just because of the interest rate as well. Yeah, that's so right. Absolutely. Right before the interest rate goes up, you lock in a thirty-year rate with a big bank. It's mm-hmm. not going to go down. I mean, it's like the the perfect time to buy, and it's also yeah. you know people say, oh well, it's at the top of the market, um, but you know these properties. If you buy a property and lock in a thirty-year rate at this low of an interest rate, um, the rents the rents on in these markets that we're investing in too, just don't change that much. Even, mm-hmm. even if there is some sort of recession, Yeah. Um, you know, the rents are 700, 800 bucks for a three bedroom, one bath, single family home, a thousand square feet. You know, they're not going to go to 200, $300 a month just because there was a recession. That's um, right. It doesn't happen in, in these neighborhoods. So, you know, maybe the value of your property will go from 70 grand to 50 grand during that recession. But as long as you don't sell, it doesn't matter anymore um mm-hmm. and we all know there's a recession coming but we don't know when so um so, still... so yeah one thing you learn in the when you look at investment in the stock market you, you don't try to time your uh your investment so in the stock market you don't try to say oh, i'm gonna buy it at the low and i'm gonna sell high i mean that's what you're trying to do but you can never time it perfectly so you have to figure out other methods for, uh, for for timing, for finding out when is a good time for me to sell, when is a good time for me to buy, um, you know. And so you don't try to always try to 
get it at the very lowest and at the very high. And it's the same thing for real estate. I mean, this is, uh, if the numbers work now, uh, you know, they, it's just going to get better over the years uh, because, you know, you're going to have the net cash flow. Uh, your principal on your, uh, on your mortgage is going to get paid. So you're going to have more equity in the house. You're going to have a tax deduction uh, every year that's going to help with, uh, and then yeah, tax deduction and also in terms of um, uh, depreciation. Yeah. If, you want to, if you want to do depreciation. <clears throat> so you have all, uh, and that helps you today. And then in 10, 15 years from now, then you're, uh, yep. you know, you're in very good shape. Yep. And the thing is that if you want to invest, if you're, if you're a millennial and you want to invest, you know, do it before you get uh, kids and before you get married. <laughs> you know, the kids are lovely. I, I love my kids, as you know. Antoine. Good answer. <laughs> but it's just, it takes a lot of time and effort uh, when you're having children and, and money. you're trying to work. Yeah. Yeah, and well worth it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, if you want to do, like this is the like, time to do it, like before you get married and yeah. um, have kids. Then you can relax a little bit and really enjoy your kids for fifteen yeah. years, and then you know, really, well, fifteen years because after that they're not they're not kids anymore. They, you know, I don't know. I got it. More buddies. So we were just we were just friends until we were 15 <laughs> you were kids until you were <laughs> then after that it was more like hell while you were my partner in a number of businesses <laughs> <laughs> i think it was 14 Is that 14 uh, the first one yeah it was that the, the shoes was that the shoes no that was tracklet oh the tracklet yeah um okay well what's your so what's so now you're invested in real estate or have been for the couple of years again after those experiences growing up i guess you can call it mm -hmm. um, yeah so then and then we kind of turned you on to it again and especially with the out of state and making it possible with technology and mm -hmm. the time you know the time you not you had but we had i guess so yeah. you know we had atn brother um he's a year younger than me but then you know you were full, working full-time you wanted to invest in something Stock mm -hmm. market's, of course, the easiest option, um, mm -hmm. but then because you didn't know about real estate and didn't have the time to, you know, you did some quick math about properties locally in the Bay Area, but then you're like, oh, none, none of this makes sense. I need to do something else. But then, you know, you work full time. So like you have mm -hmm. time to go and do all that research. Yeah. So then we come into play and we're interested in it. And then you say okay, well, like, try this. And we tried it. And then you say, okay, mm -hmm. try this. So it was like, you were kind of leading us in the direction of, of where to go and what to do. But you just mm -hmm. didn't have the time. I mean, we were, yeah. we were both going to school, whether it be college or high school and doing all this research and math and because we had the yeah. time to do so. Mm -hmm. So then we started. Yeah. So then we finally started investing out of state, blah, blah, blah. Now we have a, you know, a sizable rental property portfolio that's growing every month yeah so what's your what's your end goal i guess i mean you're still working full-time and investing you know almost all your money into the business into real estate and your own portfolio but what's your what's your end goal i guess and how is real estate gonna get you there well so my end goal is really to be uh you know uh, have my passive income completely uh cover my uh my expenses, my monthly expenses. Yeah. So to be basically financially independent, and then uh, and then continue to build a business and be and uh, basically being involved more in in the business, do less consulting, um, you know, do do uh, and be a little bit more picky about the the consulting engagements that I would do. Yeah. And uh, you know, I still enjoy doing that, but really focus on, on the business and what's uh, what's important yeah um and you know like we're preparing like a a big step right now uh yeah. for us <laughs> but um yeah so i really doubled down on the uh on the on the on the business and really i mean one of the things too that really got me started and thinking about that now is that it really because we're thinking about the next step, right? Yeah. And at my age, I mean, we're looking at where's my asset at my age. 
uh, it's in the house. So that's a bunch of, like a lot of money and equity is stored in that house. And then you can't do anything with it. Yeah. And it's so frustrating. Yeah. And uh, I mean, well, so for you, everybody, you so the, my parents bought their house in when? 2001 or two or something? 2003, I think. 2003 in the Bay Area. They've owned it ever since. That's the house I grew up in. And then, so now they, they still own it. And the house is, you know, since 2002, everything in the Bay Area has quadrupled, tripled in value. So, but they still own that house. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, um, yeah. So I, I'd like, I would like to have my money and my equity work for me. Like I've worked for many years to build that equity. Now I'd like, I'd like them, I'd like them, the equity and the money. Uh, to work for me so I can relax. Yeah. Because my equity has been relaxing for years. It's just like laying there, do nothing. Since 2003. So now it's, yeah. So now it's my turn to lay there and have my money go to work. Exactly. As you sleep. So sell the house yeah. or whatever it may be. Use that equity to then invest in rental properties or apartment buildings and then mm -hmm. be financially free. So you can choose yeah. what work you want to do and when you want to work if you yeah. if you want to do any work at all and then um yeah make your money work for you instead of sitting and yeah. sleeping on it yep. yeah okay that's right well thanks for coming on and talking for an hour thank you for inviting me it's been the longest episode thus far <laughs> the others have been me alone for 20 or yeah. 30 minutes uh -huh. but yeah we'll have you back again soon um hopefully once the big step changes and then a couple of yep. steps after that then we can come yep. and recuperate and s tell everybody what happened so yeah. yeah there's a couple of big things about to happen this year in 2018 so yeah keep well, everybody we can talk maybe we can talk about it beforehand and then see if people think i'm crazy <laughs> <laughs> when do you want to talk about it <laughs> i know next time okay next time Okay. Or another time. Well, thanks yeah. for coming. Thanks for talking uh -huh. to me. Thank you very much. Yep. All right. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.